and it's protruding up. They had an 80% casualty bombing rate over, over Holland one time. And they asked for volunteers for our outfit because we we were handy with 50 caliber. Uh -huh. but we, we, they, we, they got no takers. <laughs> we were in direct line with the bomb, the German bombers going to London uh -huh. and never found us. Of course, we couldn't have shot at them because the Bofer and the 50 caliber were for low flying planes. Uh -huh. and, and, the, and what we protected was the air base where they put us right in the middle middle of the ammunition dump. Oh. So if they dropped bombs, we wouldn't have been here. So it's ironic, it could have been the same outfit that the, which, the which, Where was the, uh, it was in a place called Matching Green. This was Chelmsford. Oh, I think Georgia know. was where that is. It's direct line between London and um, and the coast. Uh -huh. We only stay there a short time. The, another thing about the B-26, they had a lot of training accidents because it was because of its shape or its size it was difficult to maneuver when you were landing and they, they had a saying while they were training called one a day in Tampa Bay they trained I guess where McDill is now and they lost a lot of planes coming into land they wound up in the uh, in the water uh, you needed a very, very good, experienced pilot, which they didn't have that much of at the time, to, you know, to take off and land. Yes? The B-26 had a fancy wing, flew wildly, and until they learned to fly at the main, but once they learned to fly, they didn't fly anything else. Uh-huh. That was their Oh, okay, I, I didn't know that. I'm not that technically savvy, yes? I, on, on that same order, uh, uh, from what I know about it, I, you know, this could be wrong, but what I had heard was uh, the, the wing is very small compared to the weight, the high wing loading, uh -huh. uh, which gives it great speed and performance when it's up to speed. But it, uh, because of uh, the, lo the little wing area, it was called the flying prostitute, yeah, I heard that, yeah. Because it had no visible means of support. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and also they flew at a lower altitude, I think 14, 15,000 feet tops, whereas the B-17 and 24 could fly over 20,000 feet. I, uh, on that same order, uh, even though it turned out to be, uh, in the long run, one of the safer planes to be in, because of the high speed and, and uh, uh, performance. Uh, and also, yeah, the also they flew. Uh, in, in the B-26 uh, was lower than like B-17 or whatever. They flew shorter missions also because of the, uh, they couldn't go so high. Any, any other questions? Yes? I was just saying this. Uh, the B-26, I was a pilot, and the oh. B-26 had the reputation of being a very fast airplane. If you didn't get it on the first run, you'd never catch it. Uh -huh. So you always had to, and I used to make runs on it, mm. always had to get ahead, and then come around and go down and make the run. Uh, but it was fast. So I think the Pop Wolves would have trouble catching them if they weren't ahead of them. Uh -huh. Can I ask you, uh, for your address of the 90th Division, where they have their reading? Well, they're having a reunion in uh, the August, I think, 4th. Would you mind somehow? Sure. Give me that? Yes. Because I, I haven't gotten in touch with my outfit. Which, which company were you in? 3rd Battalion 358, which we were talking about. And we were a tough outfit. Oh, yes. And we... Okay. I'll give you the information later, yeah. And I spoke with General Patton, or he spoke with me at one time, and I asked him if we were going to attack a certain territory, 
he says to me, you will, son, you will. <laughs> and he was that gutsy son of a bitch. Oh, yes. <laughs> he wasn't afraid to be killed. And he was mad as hell when he died on the Jeep. Mm. He said, that's a hell of a way to die. Yes. That was his word. Oh, it was. And he was a great man. Yes, he was. They, the tankers loved him, most of them. Because he had guts. The only thing he lacked was gasoline. He wanted to go to yeah. Berlin. And he, the, the Russian said no. Yes. They diverted the gasoline to Operation Market Garden up in Holland. Was anybody here for last month's talk by Mary Previ? Yes. Oh, she was good, yeah. yes. I, I recorded that on CD, so I, I have some, if well, anybody wants, good. yeah, I have her talk. I thought my, my guy, she's a, a tough act to follow, but she was very, very moving her. I, you know, that I was, thought that... That was unusual for, for a gentleman to have her given that... It was more or less a lecture. Yes. But it, it it's, it's like a one-woman show. It's very theatrical. Yes. And we appreciated, I think, the people that were there yes. were here thought she was great. Yes. And thank you for well, thank, mentioning her. Thank you. And I, I have some books and audio CDs. Look, the last time I talked here, I played some of the CDs, you know, so that you could hear the stories that I've recorded. But you know, so now I've got so many stories, you know, that I've I've collected <laughs> over the years that I'm kind of involved in. That uh, you know, I'd rather just talk, and you, you need to listen to them on your own. Could you somehow make a presentation on paper and leave it for us for a future? Sure, because you have a glorious. You give us a great impression about the people that your father and yourself are familiar with. Well, so let me tell you one thing about you know what got me so involved in this. And that's, when I went to this reunion in 1987, I didn't know anybody. I, I had corresponded with the one person who was going to show me around. And when I got there and, and these veterans and their families found out that my father had been one of them. I was immediately welcomed into, it, it was like family, like being part of a family. You know, I didn't have to explain myself. I didn't have to say, oh, I'm interested in history. You know, I would say, will you tell me a story? They would tell me a story. You know, they, they just got people opened up because I was, it was like I was related to them by blood. Now, they, they wouldn't put me through college or anything like that, but, uh, you know, it really was, you know, a heartwarming thing. And so, you know, that got me coming back, and, you know, I just happened to have a tape recorder with me all the time. And I've been, you know, very fortunate to record a remarkable number of you know, moving, very moving stories. Some not so moving, but you know, most of them are really fascinating. I have, I have your uh, phone number in here. Yes. If anyone needs to get in touch with you. Yes, I have an 800, well, an 888 number. <laughs> anybody wants to call and ask a question. And I don't suppose anybody here is on Facebook. But that's the, uh, that's the new thing, you know. So I won't ask you to be my friend. <laughs> you are, you're all my friends, I mean, but it's, with Facebook it's called friending. Question on, what is the story on the Library of Congress? Uh, I'll tell you, yes, the Library of Congress, people have said, you know, why don't you, uh, why don't you uh, donate your, all these recordings that you've done to the Veterans History Project which is a wonderful project. They've gotten, you know, a, a lot of people to, you know, to record their stories. They've collected a tremendous amount of documents. 
where I fit in, or you know, where I'm concerned, the Library of Congress wants to have all sorts of red tape. They want release forms. They want uh, release forms. That, that's enough. I, I've never, I've never done an interview and said, "Look, would you sign a release saying I can do what I want with this?" You know. In fact, uh, I just done my newest audio book in 1994. I interviewed a fellow named Leonard Lomel. He was a ranger. Very uh, what? He's oh, he spoke here. Okay, the prominent uh, veteran. He's been in Tom Brokaw's book. He's been in uh, interviewed also all over. But I never said, would you sign a waiver so that I could put this on an audio book? And so I never did anything with it. And now I was doing a uh, collection, a second collection of D-Day veterans. And I thought, should I use this or should I not use it? Should I call him? He's still alive. He's like 91 years old. He's an attorney. Yes, I know. But I, uh, I was at a toy soldier show a couple of weeks ago. I sell these at toy soldier shows, at plastic modeling shows, at war gaming conventions. And somebody came up and said, oh, well, you should interview Leonard Lomel. He's my, he might be his great uncle or his grandfather. And I said, oh, I interviewed him back in 1992. But you know, I don't know if I can use it for this purpose. And he said, oh, he loves stuff like this. You know? <laughs> so I still haven't called it, but I put it on the collection. And I, I don't see that he's going to object to it. But uh, what was the original? Oh, the Library of Congress. So that all that I have done, I could say here, you know, I'd like you to have copies of this, but I don't have any release forms. And, and another thing about the Library of Congress, which it's kind of a shame, but it's, it's all done by amateur historians, you know, much of it, you know, who sign up as like a community or library project. And on this trip, I tried like crazy to get a hold of one guy I wanted to interview. I was going to be in Arizona. He lived in uh, not too far, maybe 90 minutes from Mesa. And I kept calling him and calling him and calling him and the no answer, no answer. I let it ring 18 times. I thought maybe he was hard of hearing. And I finally gave up. And then I went to the internet and I found out he had an interview done through the Library of Congress. And it was online, you know, so that uh, at least some of his story has been preserved. And then the first thing I noticed, or maybe the second thing, was it had his bomb group wrong. I mean, he was in the 445th bomb group, and it said he was in the 145th bomb group. You know, it's just a typographical error, but these things wind up, you know, in, in 30 years, some historian might read this, and they'll put him in the wrong bomb group and have him in the wrong place. And that's, you know, it's not a knock on the, the Library of Congress program, but you know, it should be a little more, I would like to see it be more, yeah. yeah. This is too much stuff, though. I mean, I get this idea of a huge warehouse full of this stuff that maybe 100 years from now somebody will start looking at it. Yes, and, and that's, why, on fire. that's why I do what I do. I, I have, over the years, the decades, I've got about 600 hours of interviews that I've done. And it was when I got laid off by the newspaper. I had already started, you know, dabbling with this. But I thought, why not put these on CD in their voices and get them out there so that, you know, high school kids can listen to them. People, you know, there's so many young people, by young, you know, I'm already going into the 30s and 40s, who love history, are fascinated by World War II. They constantly watch anything on the History Channel. They read books and books and books, and there are so many books. And then they have a maybe a 90-minute commute. What can they do in the car? 
you take an audio CD of you know one of these fellows talking for 80 minutes or 70 minutes, and the next thing you know, you've gone 70 miles without even thinking about it. Because you know, you've got a World War II veteran you know, telling you stories while you're driving. So that's, that I've been taking these and putting them out you know, in, front of the, in front of the public. I sell them on eBay. And you know, comes, comes Christmas time, a lot of women you know, will be browsing World War II. Oh, my husband's a history buff. And they'll say, oh, look at this. And then they'll leave me feedback. Oh, my husband loved it. You know, so I'm getting it out there to people who don't, you know, who wouldn't normally have access to it. In fact, uh, just yesterday on Amazon.com, somebody bought four of my audio books. That's about all the tanker-oriented ones. And the purchaser, or the place to send it to, was care of a, a film company. And I looked, I looked at his name, and of course I went straight to the internet, I googled the film company, I looked at, and he's like a well-known Hollywood writer. He's probably you know, doing research for a book on, the, not a book, a movie. I, now he's, he had been, according to his bio, his name is David Ayer, he had been a submariner, I guess, you know, in the 60s, or he's only about 40 years old. But he's very successful. He, uh, he was a screenwriter for uh, The Fast and the Furious, the car racing uh, movie. You know, he's got a very impressive list of credits. Anyway, a Hollywood uh, film writer took an interest in this. So, you know, it's getting out there. Uh, the stuff that I've done has been used as source material for uh, probably in two dozen different books. There, there was just a documentary on the History Channel called Patton 360, a 10-part series about General Patton. I've only seen two, two episodes, but they contacted me and said, could I provide them with any living veterans who served under Patton? I could have given them you, but the Marty, was, would you please come to circulation? Thank you. This was a year ago. And I, they used two veterans whose names I gave them. One is in a lot of my books. And the other one uh, they took from one of my books. And they, they interviewed them, them themselves. But, you know, I, I got a little credit, you know, in the back of the, uh, if you blink, you probably miss it. But it gets their stories, the people that I've had contact with. It gets them out there. So that's... That's what I've been doing, and that's why I, I love, you know, groups like this, because I think the uh, the lecture, the Abington, the World War II Lecture Institute, is one of the most unique programs of its kind. I, in fact, I sent, I tried to interest the Philadelphia Inquirer in <laughs> coming down, but with no no success. Well, you could. Uh in your history about General Patton, I said that he had a lot of cuts. And this particular time when we're getting shelled, we all hit the ground and he's standing up there like that because it's going over you. Yeah. When you hear it, it's not going to hit you. Yeah. Did and he say that? that? That's exactly what he uh -huh. said. If we all hit the ground and you try to get under your helmet, you yeah. you're getting shelled. Uh -huh. But the shells were maybe. 500 yards back sure. that way. And he says, you're a bunch of scared of cats. <laughs> <laughs> that's true words of Patton. Yeah. And he, as I said, he was gutsy, even though he made mistakes in the hospital. I don't blame him, because it hit him mentally. He was thinking about the troops that are fighting. He wasn't thinking about this poor guy that suffered. Yeah. He was passing his own impression of how he felt. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't ask your name. Well, let's forget the name. <laughs> Matthew Reluga, like Beluga Caviar. Reluga, okay, yes. 
Any other questions for uh, Aaron? I, I just I just wanted to say that uh, you brought up uh, about uh, Reading Air Show uh, coming up. It's uh, June 4th, 5th, June 4th and 6th. June 4th, 6th. And uh, if anybody doesn't know about that, when you mentioned it, it didn't seem like uh, everybody knew about it. But if there's any questions about it, uh, look on the internet, maam.org, Mid Atlantic Air Museum. Yes, ma'am, M A A M. And uh, it's a fascinating thing. I, I, I work there as a, a flight safety module, oh. trying to keep people from getting run over by airplanes <laughs> and vice versa. But uh, it's really fascinating for anybody, uh, any enthusiast. That's definitely a record, right? Yeah. That's the only uh, one, one more. Yes? Yeah. Uh, the military airbase? Uh, the only airbase. Yeah, common and ready. Do they have their uh, Scorpion done yet? Uh, no, that is not, that, it's not Scorpion, the, the, the Black uh, Widow, I'm sorry. The, the Black Widow. I was I'm, close. I'm sure they don't have to finish yeah. it. They've been doing that for an awful long time. No, I understood it was three days. Four or five weeks. Oh, Friday, yeah. Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Yep. You want to try to get the P-51s up there. They, they have, uh, I love this. Right. Right. Well, thanks a lot, Aaron, for coming down from Thank you. Jersey. And uh, we'll see you next time. You want to comment on what you have in the back of the room for everyone here? Oh, oh I have a microphone. Yeah, there are some of my books and some of the audio books that I've done. The audio books are about 10 hours long. They're full-length interviews with people, with veterans, usually with a theme. Like one of them uh, called Once Upon a Tank in the Battle of the Bulge in 1992. I got four guys sitting around a table at a reunion talking about the day their tank was knocked out 47 years earlier. They were in the same crew, and then I interviewed each of them individually. And uh, what a bunch of characters. And I went and tracked down the fifth one who didn't show up at the reunion. So there's one set of D-Day tapes, actually two sets, the new ones, they were also uh, one is seven different D-Day veterans. It's all, it's 11 hours long. And then there's a set of former prisoners of war that I interviewed. So it's a mix. And also, I have Mary Praveet's uh, speech from last, for, for $3 a donation to the uh, program, you can have a copy of Mary Praveet's interview. The, my book, Tanks for the Memories is $15. That was my first book. And the audio books are $10 each. Thank you. Also wanted to mention these cards that I handed out are from Bill Pranzato and the Veterans of the Battle of the Bulge Group in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania that meets at the Coast Guard Auxiliary. So uh, thank you for coming and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Was the chosen.